Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today in beautiful Southern California, though it's raining pretty heavily. About to have a conversation with Guillaume Auxand Marx about Chateau Aubriant and La Clarence d'Aubriant. Introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for your podcasting, and always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now sporting the Bordeaux series of wines, actually. But not why we're here. Actually, I, I do want you to have a listen up. We just released uh, a podcast with El Rodriguez. This is one fancy, uh, I'm not going to say fancy, one jovial, funny Latina in wine. She's an influencer, but a very structured influencer. I think you're going to find it very interesting. She's up right now. Have a listen to El Rodriguez. But not why we're here. We're here to talk to Guam Alexandre Marx, which doesn't sound very French. Mm. He's the commercial director of Domaine Dion, and also which owns the brands Chateau Briand, the winery, Chateau Aubryon, Chateau La Mission Bion, Aubryon, and Chateau Quintas, and Cla- not well, we just tasted Clarence, Clarendale. Uh, uh, no, uh, Clarence, uh, what you tasted is a second wine of uh, Chateau Brion. And so we have three estates. We have uh, Chateau Brion and Chateau de la Mission Brion, located both in the appellation of Pessac Léonien. And we've got Chateau Quintus located in the Saint Emilion appellation. So I got, a, I got a question, a very important question. How come the Madoc is above Omadoc? Huh. Fit geographically, isn't that? <laughs> does that make any sense? Does it? it doesn't make any sense. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the map the other day. Uh, it should be the other way around. Yes, you're okay. right. You're right. But uh, it must have a, a reason. Must be ex- can be explained. But yes, uh, Aubryon is uh, really at the entrance of the Medoc. The, sorry, the Aubryon, the Omedoc. And after we've got the Medoc on uh, in the northern part. Yes. So let, let's go north in the Omedoc, just for the listeners to understand the layout of Bordeaux. We're talking about the left bank. Yes. Uh, which is on the left side of the rivers. Yep. And we're going to go up. So we start at the Omedoc and we're going to go to where? Uh, Omedoc, after you go north yes. of Omedoc, you yes. have Margot, Margo. which is the first uh, very known appellation. I will not uh, talk about uh, Listrac and other kind of satellite appellations. Sorry for the people <laughs> if you're from there. Are from. <laughs> now I'm talking about the classification of 1855. So you've got uh, appellation of Margot. Then, after, what do you get? You get Saint-Julien, oh, Saint-Julien. Poyac, Saint-Estephe. And after, on top, uh, above uh, Saint-Julien, yes, we've got the Médoc, uh, part of the Médoc appellation. So, Aubryon is in Pouillac proper, right? No, uh, alors, Aubryon is in a pessac Léonien appellation, which is out of the Médoc. So, the thing is, it's, this is where it's a little bit complex, is Aubryon is the oldest uh, estate of Bordeaux. Is a... Um, at that time, in the, when the classification of 1855 was asked by Napoleon III for the Universal Exposition to have a classification of the growth of Médoc, they had to include Aubryon, which mm-hmm. was in the Grave Pesa. Appellation, so Pessac Léonien Appellation. So it's due east of, of Pouillac or Saint-Julien or Margot? I mean, uh, Aubryon is the only estate in the classification of 1855 out of Medoc. Out of the Medoc. That's the only one. So do you know, do you know what Napoleon III, which is uh, what the great nephew of the famed general, uh, why why do they classify this? I know it's for the exposition uh, of Paris. No, but l- l- let's, let's say uh, the way it has been made, uh, the reference at that time was Aubryon in the Iron Wines. After you had uh, as kind of similar quality and recognition of uh, estate was Latour, Lafitte, mm-hmm. and Margot. Mm-hmm. So it's like if today, you know, in, if you take uh, the luxury uh, car business, uh, you put uh, Aston Martin, <laughs> you put a Bugatti, you put whatever, but you had to include Ferrari at some point. You know what I mean? Of course. So You can't put Renault in there, can you? No, we are talking about <laughs> I and uh, oh, I okay, brand. Uh, so, so yes, Aubryon was uh, is a, exactly the same as a car business. Uh, let's say you cannot make a ranking of uh, luxury and cars without putting Ferrari because Ferrari is right. the basement, mm-hmm. is the foundation, and this is what was Aubryon, right. and this is what is still Aubryon today. 
So it was, you, but wasn't it the buyers or the negotiants of the time that that the Napoleon went to and said, "Look, I need a classification yep. for the Paris," and it was based on the the pricing at the time or the, just the it, quality? It, was, it was based on, on on the pricing, but the pricing was based on the quality on the, the terroir. Right. It was a consequence. Right. Okay. And it's the same in Saint Emilion. Saint Emilion was exactly the same. The, the the classification. I mean, back in the days. It was only focused on the price of the of the grape that, that you are selling, and it was a consequence on the quality of the terroir. As simple. So that as was uh, and, uh, just for the listeners. Eighteen, I think it was nineteen fifty five. A hundred years later, that the the, the Grand Cru Classé Saint Emilion yeah, occurred, exactly. where Cheval Blanc yeah. and the rest were qualified. So, so here we are in eighteen fifty five. We've created these, and for the listeners again, there's five growths: first through fifth, premier, cinquième, and then. And then we have Bordeaux Superior, no? Yes. And then Bordeaux. And then... Yeah, uh, we, we have 65 different appellations oh. in Bordeaux. <laughs> well, let's not so go through them right lot. now. <laughs> no, it's a bit too much. Uh, you know, uh, for classic uh, wine lovers, if you can name, let's say, 15 appellations in Bordeaux, it's already pretty good. You're pretty good, yeah. Pretty good, you know? There's a lot of small. Like, you go with uh, Medoc or Medoc, uh, Saint Estef, Saint Julien, uh, Margot, Pessac Lognon, Pomerol, uh, Saint Emilion. You already, you only have eight at that point. Yeah, right. After you can go with Sauté and Barsac if you really like uh, yeah, uh, okay, sweet sure. wines. It's ten. After you can go with Porto Superior, so which is uh, something different. That's true. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, Castillon. Uh, you have uh, plenty Cote of Blay, uh, Cote de Blaye. Cote de Blaye. But we have sixty-five <laughs> different appellations like this in Bordeaux. So, yeah, the most famous ones are uh, Poyac, uh, Pessac Lognon, Saint Emilion, Pomerol, because mainly because of the great estates. If we talk about Pomerol, the first estate coming to your mind is Petrus. Petrus, right. Number one, after you have uh, VCC, Vieux Chateau Sertan, La Fleur, uh, Trotanois, uh, La Fleur Petrus, but first one is Petrus. You go to Saint Emilion, the first one to strike your mind is or are Ozo and Cheval Blanc. After, yes, if you are a very good wine lover, you will think about Quintus, of course. Of course. Uh, can be Canon, can be Fija, can be Pavi, can be Ogelus, uh, can be uh, Tertre de Boeuf, blah, blah, blah. Pessac Lognon is the same. Aubryon, Mission Aubryon, Obaï, uh, Smith Olafit, uh, Pape Clément, you name it. Pouillac, I'm amazing. I'm Pouillac. getting thirsty, at least. I'm... <laughs> uh, po po Pouillac, why Pouillac today is the most famous appellation in Bordeaux? Because you ask people, wineries of Pauillac, right. you have so much great ones. La Tour, Lafitte, Mouton, Rothschild, uh, Ponte Canet, uh, Lynchbach, Pichon Comtesse, Pichon Baron, you name it, it's full of great estates. Uh, Saint-Estef, Saint-Estef, Saint right. Calon-Ségur, Cosé Sournel, uh, Morose, of course. Uh, Félan Ségur, yeah, you name it. Uh, Saint-Julien, Saint you have all the, the uh, Poiferé. Right. The fact Leo that Ville, I understand. Barton, Leo Ville, Bois Ferré, uh, Las Cas. I mean, there, there is plenty. And everything is uh, uh, the appellation that you know are, are made, are known, I think, for me, thanks to the recognition of some estates. Mm -hmm. In Margot, the same. You have Chateau Margot. Margot, yeah. Chateau Margot. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Uh, but Palmer, Malesco, Saint-Exupéry. Uh, you have plenty, Baron Codnac, Kirwan, uh, a lot of great estates. Uh, but mainly today, people, I think, make the association of an appellation with a great estate. Can you can you go through, and I'm not asking you to do it now, but a, a wine lover, can we define these regions as terroir-driven so that you say Pouillac, oh yeah, that's Pouillac, or that's saint Julien, or that's saint Emilion. Because so much of it is driven by the grape varietals as well, but is it easier to define, or is it easy to define by terroir these regions? Can I? Can yeah, you? I think it's it's you, it's more easy to define by terroir, as long as the estate uh, is uh, serious and professional, meaning that uh, it's not like in Burgundy. Burgundy, you know, you work with a parcel, which is uh, you have the classification of the parcel, and uh, maybe on this parcel you have ten different. Uh, Winemakers. For Bordeaux, is different. We have one uh, estate, and after, within the appellation, you can purchase different parcels. So it's totally uh, 
it's totally different in terms of uh, of perception of vision. But if you have a great estate, it will remain to the core. I mean, for the grand vin, to the core of the construction of the of the wine. And after the terroir of this appellation, when it comes to tertiary aromas, you cannot go wrong. You have the feeling of uh, of this appellation. Let's say you talk about. Uh, so important. Aubryon. Okay. Aubryon, terroir of Pessac Léonion, gravel, clay, sands. When it comes to tertiary aromas, you will uh, get specific aromatic that will take over. So the terroir is taking over the grape variety. Mm -hmm. And it's almost impossible to say that because Bordeaux, it's all the wines are blended with mm -hmm. different varieties. Mm -hmm. And especially with Aubryon and Mission Aubryon, it's almost impossible to define when you got your the tertiary aromas. So we are talking right now from wines before uh, 2002. To say that it's a majority of Merlot, majority of Cabernet Sauvignon, you have a bit of Cabernet Franc, it's mm -hmm. almost impossible because the terroir is taking over. Mm -hmm. So which means the terroir is bringing a specific aromatic to your wine, which is unique in this specific occasion. So would you it's say the same with it's the same with Pouillac, the same with uh, Saint Emilion, it's the same with Pomerol, it's the same with all the great uh, appellations. That's an interesting comment. I use it all the time. And you said if it's a proper wine and uh, and I say an honest wine. In other words, it, it seems to me in Bordeaux particularly because of its history and, and its legacy that that's the winemaker's job, that's the proprietor's job is to bring to the table a wine that expresses the honest terroir, the honest construction so that you can say this is Pouillac or this is saint Julien, or this is whatever. Because we don't have honest wine everywhere in the world. We have wines that are crafted, they're blended, they're, they're, they're formulated. Yes. Uh, the, the thing is, um, New Bordeaux has a big history and all the classified growth, we all have a big responsibility in terms of, uh, of winemaking. Uh, and the difference with maybe in some specific region in the world, mainly in the uh, new world regions, but in the old world regions where uh, Bordeaux belongs, we try to protect as much as we can the, the DNA of the terroir. Mm -hmm. So if you want my own opinion, all the classified growth of Bordeaux are doing a tremendous job by trying to optimize and to re, uh, maximize the capacity of the terroir for the Grand Vin. So for me, uh, you know, if, if you go back to the, I had lately, uh, Calon Segur 1953. Calon Segur. Blind. <laughs> uh, you know, 1963? You like 1953. 53, yes. wow. Uh, which was a stunning wine. Uh, it had all the, the characteristics of, uh, of Saint Estef. Uh, meaning that you have the feeling that it can be a Poyac, but you're missing something like Poyac the, that is different from Poyac. Uh, and, and after just the approach of the terroir, which is um, a bit different, but mainly, uh, I think in Bordeaux, I truly believe in Bordeaux, all the wineries are not making wines, uh, commercial wines. They are trying to optimize the best of the terroir. And, we, so and this is the beauty of, of blending. You know, when you, you, you do a 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, but you have to deal with uh, the vintage, with what the Cabernet Sauvignon is bringing to you. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bordeaux, we have this capacity of blend, like in Champagne, to take the most of every single grape variety to really make a grand vin. Mm -hmm. And after what will change, of course, between an average uh, vintage and a great vintage is a proportion of grand vin that you will produce. Can be in a, like in 2022, like uh, we are going to, to show a beautiful, uh, beautiful vintage this year. Maybe we'll get 
on a terroir like Aubryon, maybe we can go up to 60-70% of Grand Vin. Mm -hmm. While in 2021, we only produce 40% of Grand Vin. Really? But that's our own responsibility. That's your to, responsibility. To really that. choose what is the best to make the Grand Vin. And that's why we developed the second wines, like Clarence Aubryon, and some others even went further to develop a third wine, a fourth wine, so on and so forth. So it's interesting that it's so refreshing because there's so many modern day cycles and people like sugared wine right now. So when you go to the supermarket, everything like that picture there, all the wines are, are, are doctored up with sugar and they're supposed to taste the same. And here's this, what I, what, and I use the term honest wine a lot now because it's so important for us in this industry to bring to the con consumer what real wine should be. And so what I'm hearing is that Bordeaux proper we're not crafting things for the consumer to um, to feel like they're getting the same thing every time. I'm not crafting a wine. I'm not formulating wine. I'm producing a wine that's honestly reflecting the structure, the grape varietals, and the terroir of where we're at. And do you see that changing? For the, the I'm having trouble articulating this, by the way. Do you, do you see that changing? Do you see Bordeaux moving towards the consumer, where the consumer's in charge of what they're going to drink. Or are we going to stay in Bordeaux and we're going to make sure we produce what's reflective of what's there? No, I think when we talk about uh, classified growth, uh, sorry to be straightforward, but we do wine the way we like our wines because we know our terroir. Uh, even though it, not giving uh, maybe some... Uh, if we, we want to be super commercial, maybe we, we should maybe make wine in a different, uh, from a different manners. Like if you talk about Europe, we have a big trend of natural wines. We could, we could make uh, at Aubryon really? natural wines. Huh? Okay. Uh, That's a good question. Why not? Why not? But because the winemaking process and the aromatic at the end and what we want on the very long term is not really what we want for our wines. And you, you, we have to put everything together. The terroir, the people, people are super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Never forget the people because without the people, the wine will never, never be happen. made. Right. It will never happen. The terroir is also super important. So everything has to come together. So uh, there is no fight between natural wines and not natural wines. Yeah. We are not natural at Aubryon. We want to optimize to maximize and to make the best out of every single berry on the super long term. Yes. That's our our, our target. We are not looking for a Cabernet Drive wine yes. or a Merlot Drive wine or a Cabernet Franc Drive wine. With this, we don't care. We want to have the taste of what should taste Aubryon. So for this, since one century, we have one family making the wines at Aubryon, the Delmas family. We don't have any outside consultant. We are the only uh, classified growth without wow. uh, outside consultant. That's interesting. So we do the wine the way we like our wine to be tested, the way the grandfather transmits to the father, the father transmits to the son. And after, sometimes it doesn't please to anyone, but this, to be totally, to be totally honest with you, we don't care. Yeah. We, we want <laughs> to make the wine the way we like our wines, according to our terroir. And I think that's super important. And I, th I think that's why Bordeaux, at some point uh, on the short term, can be, uh, uh, some people maybe doesn't really like it. But if you look on the long term, because Bordeaux wines can age for 50, 60 years without any issue if the storage has been made properly, Ah, there is no better. There is no better region in the world. You know, I I, I think that's really. Maybe you think it's arrogant, or maybe you think it. You used a word when we were talking earlier that I can't remember now, but it's refreshing. It's refreshing to know that that in Bordeaux, in particularly the classified growers, but I'm sure so, so many um, smaller chateau and non classified chateau are doing the same thing in that. They want to produce the best they can produce to honestly reflect the terroir. And, and you talked about the people. This is an important part of this because I've heard this a lot of times on the show, which is without, you know, wine doesn't make itself and it's the people. But I have this new thought, okay, where 
you've got 1935 when Clarence Dillon bought the place. Well, I don't know. Is it Dillon? Because he's not French. He's American. Yeah. <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> Dylan. Yeah. But I think all these stories roll forward. We had the war. We had, we'll talk about that in a second, but the war did a lot of damage to Bordeaux and there was a lot of crazy things that went on. And the stories that the grandfather told that the son and the son tells the other son and they continue to go forward. Do not all those pieces of information control what is in that bottle eventually. This roll up, all these stories, all this history, all this knowledge of all the vintages we've ever made end up in every bottle that we make at the end of the, at the end of that harvest. Yeah, of course it does. I mean, uh, again, uh, we've got uh, the, the human factor is something that is ne neglected today in uh, in Bordeaux wineries. But if you step back a bit and you think about uh, think about something. Today, in Bordeaux, we name the wines by the name of the estate. Mm -hmm. Compared to Burgundy, where you name That's the true, estate yeah. by the name of the winemaker. Oh, right. But just look at Bordeaux. You can name, if you are just a, a classic wine lover, you can name 50 different, easy 50 different families. Mm -hmm. The Caz, the Tesseron, uh, you can name it. You have yeah. plenty of people who are making uh, Bordeaux today thanks to their own personality. After, we cannot please everyone, that's it. But at least behind every single Bordeaux wines, you don't have a trademark, you have really personality, people behind a terroir, and you have a taste, a wine. That's why when you do blind testing, sometimes you can say, ah, it's a Lynch Bage, ah, it's a Ponte Canet, ah, it's a Pichon Baron, mm -hmm. ah, it's mm -hmm. a Trotanois, ah, it's a Fijac, ah, it's a Canon. Because uh, you give, you take out the best of your terroir and you add your own personal touch. Mm -hmm. And that's the people. And this is the beauty of wine. Wine, a good bottle of wine is a bottle of wine that is bringing you emotions. Yes. And emotions is bringing you thanks to the people, for me. The, the emotion the, comes the, from the people. Yes, the entire quality of the wine and all the quality of the wines of the berries come from the terroir, from the nature, from everything. But of course. after the vinification, all that, if you just let the berries all together, it becomes vinegar. Mm -hmm. It's not wine. Right. You need the, you, the human factor behind. So it comes with your own personality, uh, your your wish to control every single step or not, or to let go a little bit there, or to adapt, or to uh, the aging process, or do you want to really have your wine? And it comes with your own personality. And after this, your personality the reflection comes in the glass in your bottle. I think that is a great argument against quote unquote natural wine because so many of the wines I've tasted here over the years, they're, some of them are undrinkable because they're so natural they don't, they don't yeah. have any personality and they have no expression of anything. It's just we didn't want to touch it. And here we're talking be, about the exact opposite. We want be, to make it happen. Be, because we shouldn't be talking about natural wines or natural wine. We should be talking about wine. That's it. Yeah, that's it. And you have amazing uh, winemakers doing natural wines, but because they put so much of their personality into the wine, the wine is great. And you have people who are making natural wines because it just gives you the possibility to, to sell your wine more expensive. Well, and I don't at know the that's end, the case. And at the end, it's not wine. It's just I undrinkable. So... It's, but, it's, but it's the same for, for a, let's say, <laughs> into bracket classical wines. You have great classical wines that are amazing because, again, it has been produced, uh, truly produced to really take the best out of the terroir and made the best of the people. And you have uh, some wines that are just undrinkable because it's too oaky, it's too extracted. There is no percentage, there is nothing. They just put a kind of uh, procedure that, Mm -hmm. How do you do to make one? We do it like this yeah, because right. we have some consumers uh, at the other side of the world they like it like this, and we do, and it's yeah, and you have nothing behind. That's the problem that we have consumers that instead of we have consumers that want to taste what is happening in Bordeaux, what's happening in Argentina, what's happening in Napa, we have consumers that want to taste something other than you know, the formula that we've put it together for them. And that's, for me, that's a problem. And I, and I have this hope though, that all generations, including millennials, Z, X's and L, M, N, O, P, that eventually 
they arrive at the conclusion that a proper glass of wine is reflective of all the things you just said, the history, the people, the terroir, the grapes, everything that happens in a bottle of wine, because it does connect you. It is an emotional thing. It does connect the body, the soul to the earth. And that's what it's about. Yep. So how, how did, how did Clarence Dillon in 1935, because I found that fascinating, was able to buy Chateau Aubryon? I mean, this is like, this is, this is well after the classification. It's the first growth. I mean, how is that for sale? <laughs> because at that time, it, because Bordeaux was a disaster, no one was making money on wine. No one. In Nobody. 1935. Nobody. Uh, the Dillon family, to give you a story, I, I just said the story to, to a few clients before, but, you know, uh, Clarence Dillon was uh, a true Francophile. He was in love with France, was in love with French wines, and was in love with Bordeaux. So he came at some point, but in 1935, Aubryon was not the only first growth to be on, on sale. Really? Cheval Blanc was on sale. Chateau Margaux was on sale. Wow. And uh, he loved the three wines, but for some reason, like I mentioned before, uh, Aubryon was really the historical estate of Bordeaux. Uh, it had something like was very special also with uh, uh, the British market and the American market. So we decided to purchase uh, Aubryon. Uh, the Dillon family from 1935 to 1975, they didn't win one single franc. Nothing. They were losing money every single year. Wow. So they were just putting, investing money to maintain the estate at a good quality level. Yeah. Uh, and from 1975 to 1995, they just break even. So they were not making money. They just they were just not making money. That's, That's it. unbelievable. Not losing money. So, and the first dividend that we're giving back to the family happened for us in 1996. That's phenomenal. No, but that's the situation of Bordeaux. Bordeaux wines are becoming a bit more expensive with the development of um, the export market. Yes. But this happened uh, thanks to uh, thanks to an American fellow, uh, Robert Parker, with a wine advocate, who really put in the eighties uh, Bordeaux on the on the front of uh, of, of the market. It's really modern history. I it's, mean, yeah, but it is. But that's the reality. People think that uh, me, uh, Aubryon yeah, <laughs> or whatever, or Margot or Lafitte are making money. No, they were not. That's fa fascinating. They were not. Lafitte, they started to be super famous with uh, 1982 vintages. Yeah, the 82 vintages. That they sold like 15 years after. Yeah, right. So you have to put that again into a very perspective. And after, we've got the Chinese market will pass a lot, of course, from the vintage 2005 onwards. So it's, it's not... Unbelievable. <laughs> I just got an email today from the Beverly Hills wine merchant, my friend Dennis Silverstreet, uh, for the 2014 Aubryon was $750 a bottle. So that's a far cry from 1975. Yeah. Because it wasn't the 70s a bad time for Bordeaux anyway, with some bad the, vintages uh, and there's just the, a... The, the, the 70s were, were, were difficult. 75 for us was a, is still a, a stunning vintage. But it, the 70s were, uh, were difficult, even though 70 was great for us also. But, but it's not like uh, in the 50s or early 60s, or not even in the 80s. 80s, you have uh, 82, 85, 89, which are just superb. And after, you've got great, nice vintages, like 88, uh, 84, 83, uh, that are really good. But... Um, it's true that um, we we developed a lot. We got a more uh, professional in the winemaking process over the decades. Uh, and thanks also to the possibility to sell wine, uh, to have a more demand. And so uh, to have a, to have a better uh, winemaking process and vinification and uh, care on the, on the, in the vines. You know, the 1935, you know, things were disrepair. Uh, the war comes in 1940. Mm. Uh, is the demarc the, uh, the the France was split in 1940, and Chateau was on the occupied side. And I read that it became a rest home for the Luftwaffe. But there's a lot of really tragic stories that came out of uh, Bordeaux during the war. One that's interesting to me, and that is the Germans learned um, 
from World War I, where they, it was brutally bloody and difficult on vineyards and places of culture, that they wanted to spare the wines and actually drink them. And so I understand that that Oberon. So this is, is this is part of the history of the chateau. Is it is it talked about? Is it discussed? Do people know about it? Do you, or is it sort of forgotten? No, I have no idea what happened during this, uh, this oh, occupation <laughs> time. Uh, if if they wanted to drink Aubryon, I'm sure they had good taste, <laughs> and we know. <laughs> well, there was a you know. <laughs> no, when the wine is good, the wine is good. So of course, uh, no, I have no idea. The, one thing for sure is, and what is amazing, if you taste. Uh, uh, you know, at the liberation in 1945, uh, 45 uh, border wines are just uh, out of this world. They're just amazing vintage. They are. I had the chance to drink uh, once in my life, Aubryon 45. Wow. Thanks to an American uh, citizen I met in Bordeaux. And the guy told me, you know, I've got a bottle of Aubryon 1945 at home. He was living, uh, I still living uh, in Fort uh, Lauderdale. And I said, yeah, wow. good. And he said, do you want to to come to visit me and we drink the bottle together? Wow. I said, Dude, whenever you want. And look at me say, you know what? We should do it on the 8th of May because that's the date of yeah, the liberation. Right. I said, Dude, I take a plane. I'm coming uh, to drink the bottle with you. That's and I flew from Bordeaux uh, on the... On, so on the on the 7th to be able to be, uh, to be in Miami on the 8th. Story. And, uh, and the bottle was uh, just uh, amazing. It was a great brand. So, yeah, again, you know, that's, uh, I think thanks to wine, we, we go through time, we go through history, and we got, and a bottle of wine uh, is giving us uh, this possibility to, uh, to remember some moments in your life forever. There's no other product no, like that. No. And that's none, what's so fascinating. None, because uh, once the bottle is done, it's done. You yeah, will well, never be well, able to, to, to call it back. So well, just, to give you a little history, uh, it, when when Goering came into Paris, the first thing he did was he went to Tour d'Argent and he went in the basement and he took 80,000 bottles of wine. And and the vintages during the war were sporadic because of the, there was no sulfur. You know, they were trying to make copper sulfate from yeah. old pots and pans. And so there's some bad vintages here. So there's sparse vintages. And so to get a bottle of 45, Aubryon is just... What a fascinating opportunity to do. I will say I did a, um, years ago, when one of the big suppliers in in LA uh, when closed their doors, I bought a vertical of 88 first growths. And I opened them for some friends during COVID. So when 2020, so they were 32 years old and they were fascinated. Only one had turned and that was the Margot. The rest were beautiful. The Oberon was beautiful. Uh, and the Margot, I think, just bad storage. It think, happens is sometimes. So, but I'm, I'm happy for Aubryon because you know uh, our technical director. It was his first vintage he produced for us in 1988. Really? So so far, my colleague, if he's wow, listening to I'd me to right now, uh, his first vintage was 1988, and he's still making the wines That's uh, as technical director. Nowadays, I want to tell uh, with, the story. I wrote the note somewhere. And yeah. the same with uh, our vineyard manager. Same, they started the same year together in 1988. So and I, they're still on, on site. I get, I gotta get the feeling that Clarence, because it said in your notes that he was from San Antonio. Yep. And if you've yeah. ever had wine from Texas, you can see why he was so in love with Bordeaux. <laughs> yes. <huh>? So, <laughs> because so 1935 was Chateau Briand. Then he bought La Mission. Aubryon. In 1983, yes, correct. Wow. And then you created um, Quintas. Now, what? Yes, Quintas. In, Quintas, uh, where is that? In 2011. So it's located in the best location of Saint-Emilion, on the limestone uh, plateau of Saint-Emilion. So our neighbors, we have Belair Monange from the Moex family. We have uh, uh, Canon. Uh, yeah. We have uh, a bit further um, Ozone and uh, again further uh, Pavi, we have Angelus uh, wow. nearby, so that's really in the Beau Séjour Beco, Beau Séjour du Fouragaro. So this is in this area, so on the limestone plateau. The target for us, Quintus, in the Latin language, uh, means the fifth, and it was a tradition during the Romans' time to name your fifth child Quintus. And we consider the Dillon family consider that they have uh, four children already. Aubryon Red is one, Aubryon White. He said two. Uh, Mission Red is three. 
mission white is for. Therefore, the fifth is Quintus. Of course. And behind this name is just to show the people that we want to put the same quality and the same level of uh, investment and uh, attention to Quintus compared to Aubryon and mission red and white. So with the same level of, of wine, so we want to produce one of the greatest wine of the right bank with Merlot and uh, Cabernet Franc. So I read about a tasting with Jancis Robinson. Yep. You're in the pictures. Yeah. And uh, you put up uh, the Quint Quintus against uh, Figeac and other famed Saint-Emilion wines. Yeah, and you did a complete wine tasting. Ozone, Cheval Blanc, Pavie, Angelus, and Figeac, yes. So you might as well go right to the top. Huh? You go pick the best ones. And... Yes, because we, con uh, uh, we yeah. consider that uh, the best on uh, Saint-Emilion are Ozone, Cheval Blanc, Pavi, Angelus, and Villac. So, since our target is to produce one of the best of Saint Emilion, yeah. we wanted to show sure. that our terroir is a great terroir and we wanted to show the, the work we have done since 2011 up to it was uh, 2018, the progress and the work we have done compared to what we consider the best wines in Saint Emilion. So uh, it was just to show that we have a lot of ambitions. We really want to, to keep working on Quintus and to bring Quintus at the level of quality as uh, Ozone, Cheval Blanc, Pavie, Angelus, Fijac, and Canon. So for us, it was uh, really to pay... It, it, if you see, you have two ways of seeing it. The first one is to show that, uh, okay, Quintus is at this level and the other are above or below, but this, for me, I didn't care. I just wanted to show that we have a lot of respect for all these estates. And for us, they are a benchmark to where we want the quality of wine. I'm not talking about the brand awareness. I'm talking about the quality of the wine, mm -hmm. where we want to go. We want to reach this level. And this level, as uh, Ozone, Cheval, Pavillon, Angelus, and Fijac, they are the benchmark of what we can do on the left bank with Mission and with Aubryon. So Quintos was... Uh Am I, am I saying it right? Quintos? Quintos, Quintos yes. Yeah, so yeah. was that from scratch? or yeah, was from it a, scratch. From scratch, yes. The, the vineyards also? We, yes, we, we, we purchased uh, 15 hectares in 2011. We had this opportunity to purchase uh, 15 beautiful hectares on the limestone plateau of Saint-Emilion. Wow. Uh, then in 2013, we purchased 15 extra hectares which were uh, connected to the first uh, 15 hectares. And in 2021, we purchased another 15 hectares on the just like a few uh, few meters from uh, the original parcels uh, to to reach 45 hectares of uh, so, which so is quite big yes. and so how how did you stack up I don't expect you to, you know I'm not worried about the ranking what I'm thinking of how did you stack up and what you needed to learn from this tasting up against those famous brands and you tasted against them you said okay here's where we're at and here's where we need to go is that what that came out of this? Yes. Uh, first, what is super important is uh, to realize, again, the human factor, that every single estate has its own personality, its own DNA. And this is brought, yes, by the terroir, but most specifically by the people. So, uh, and that's the beauty. When we, when we drink uh, great wines, uh, you can feel the terroir, but you, you also need to feel the human touch. Uh, if you taste Cheval Blanc or Ozone, they are totally different in style. Hmm. If you take the grape varieties, let's say the same. Fijac is a bit different because you have Cabernet Sauvignon in, in the blended. Uh, but they are totally different. Yes, the terroir is different. You don't have the same style of uh, terroir. But on top, you have the human factor behind, which are really bringing an extra uh, sensibility and uh, something extra to the personality of the wine, to the DNA of the wine, and to the, the estate. And uh, I think, to be totally honest with you, I think Quintus is on the right track uh, because the terroir is, has the capacity to bring us amazing berries from Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, as uh, the Dillon uh, estate, we never compromise on quality. So we Very. have the time. Uh, we have 16, 16 persons uh, on site every day working on the vines because don't forget that the quality of the vines is a terroir, 
but you need to work the, the vines. Huh? Mm -hmm. If you leave your, your vines like this without work, it will not bring uh, something good. So we have 16 people every single day in the vines, working, doing their best, and we keep on uh, pushing and uh, really keeping the, the, the vineyard in the best condition possible. So let me ask you a question about that 45, because since 1945, much has changed in the wine world. I mean, in my opinion, wine is still what it was 8,000 years ago when they found that winery in Armenia, 6,000 years old. It's 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 humans crafting uh, the beverage from fermenting the grapes, and so they're in control of it, like you talk about. Without them, this wouldn't happen. But stylistically, how different? Were you able to sense the style of that winemaker in 1945, given all the conditions that were that were surrounding Bordeaux at the time, which were very tumultuous? Was there an obvious style difference in that? Was it deeper, ruder, no, no, more no, complex? No, because I think the style of the winemaker uh, is uh, in if if you take the the life, uh, the complete life of a bottle of wine. The style of the winemaker uh, is super important when it's young, when it's at uh, his middle age, but when he's getting old, mm -hmm. the terroir is overtaking everything that has been done before. Wow, that's beautiful. Because everything... That's what it's about. It is, exactly. That's why usually, it's not a perfect science, but the Grand Terroir, you see them uh, in very old bottles. So that's this is the part that fascinates me, and, and it, it, it makes me think all the time. We have optical sorters now. We have trellising methodologies. We have uh, ways to um, canopy. We do all these things. Uh, to what end are we trying to do? And I think you answered the question earlier in that, at least with Bordeaux, and at least with the classified growths, our aim is to produce the best we can produce from that terroir to express that terroir. And that's not the case all over the world. You know, sometimes it's like we talked about earlier about some of these consumers. And there's something very particular that I love about France. It's why I studied French. My dad spoke French. Um, and I'm not as much a Francophile as Clarence is that I'd go out and buy a chateau. Maybe one day, though. <laughs> um, Who knows? But there's something old world, the protection of the AVA, uh, the Appellation, or the the grape varietals you're allowed to to grow in Bordeaux. And, and that the obvious difference between Bordeaux and France in general is, in the new world, is that we can do whatever we want. We can put Cabernet in Napa, and we can make opulate, opulent wines that are fully extracted, and we can make thin, lean wines if we want to. But there's something fascinating to me about protection in the French culture of those traditions. And at the same time, old world winemakers look at the new world like Argentina, Australia, America and say, wow, how much luxury we have to do whatever you want. But what's your opinion? What, how do you feel about that? I, I think it's two different ways. Uh, old world regions and more specifically uh, border region, but we can name Piemont, we can name Burgundy. Um, we have a vision that is on a super long term. So most of the of the owners in these regions, they, they've got generations of uh, of ownership mm -hmm. and of uh, craftsmanship, uh, and they look onto what the wines are making for this vintage, or it's gonna be like in fifty years, one hundred years. In the new world part. Not everybody again, but most of the people are thinking, okay, what my clients want? What can I bring them so they can have a lot of enjoyment mm -hmm. on the instant as mm -hmm. a product of consumption? Mm -hmm. So it's two different ways of seeing the same product. One product is uh, building up history, building up uh, a vision, a very long-term uh, perspective on what the earth is giving you. The other one is... I'm. Um, using what the, my, the earth is giving me mm -hmm. to please in an instant my client. Mm -hmm. Two different Two things. different yeah. vision. Uh, so it's... It's interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure there is one better than another. It's you just know. the perception. You know, like uh, Bordeaux, we say that uh, Bordeaux has this uh, famous uh, 
uh, people know Bordeaux as a, a wine that can age for decades and usually they are good after 20 years, mm -hmm. which is right. Of course, a Bordeaux of 20 years age is better than a Bordeaux from 10 years age and so on and so forth. But the good thing with newer wines is usually most of them are super enjoyable when they are young. Yeah. But after, if you want to look on the very, very long term, yeah. and I'm seeing that like uh, we had uh, for lunch, we had beautiful Napas uh, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and they are great wines. So what I'm saying, you can say, yeah, but uh, look at uh, the old Napas, they are amazing. Yes, of course, they're amazing. But I'm talking in general, if you look at the global picture, uh, All world, most of the most famous appellations, they really have the, this uh, trend of the long-term vision, the family vision generations, mm -hmm. while uh, the new world have uh, another vision that to please the clients right now. So it's, 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 it's two different it's approaches. two different ideas. It's part of the idea that you are stewards. I think most French particularly uh, historical families in the wine business look as themselves as stewards of the land. They're, yep. they're passing through. We're going to do the best we can with what we have, and we're going to hand it off to the next generation. And I, I think it's important, a really important part of culture, particularly the French culture, where you protect your butter, you protect regionally your cheeses. We don't, in America, we don't have that. You know, we've lost... Uh, once the freeways were built, we lost all regionality. We don't have a protection of Southern food or Southern made things or East coast, or you can get Texas chili in America. And you, I mean, in California, you get New England clam chowder in Texas. And so we kind of lost some of this cultural boundaries that we had originally had in America for a long time. Um, and I, I, I think maybe it's the nostalgia in me that, that loves the idea that there's some history that's maintained throughout ages for this and you 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 mentioned on the website french art de vivre yep. which is um the art of life how, how do you guys define that what you you talked about it already a little bit but let's sort of nail that down you have a michelin star restaurant du, du Zitoile, du at, star the, at, at the um, chateau but What are you protecting? <laughs> the art de vivre. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's the most beautiful thing uh, when you like uh, eating and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> so. And on top of that, on top of that, eating, drinking. But most important is sharing. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, the, uh, the most difficult, you know, is like with the human beings is to go without um, to be as, uh, as raw as possible. Mm -hmm. The real product without uh, uh, interaction of whatever it is, that's really the true value of every single product. And the art de vivre à la française is really to, first, is a raw material, and after, you bring a little touch by the chef, this combination mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. nature and humans. And I think that everything made for sharing to enjoy this moment together, Because a bottle of wine, you will never enjoy a bottle of wine if you're alone. You will enjoy it with people because you share emotions. And the food and the wine is all about emotion. So the more you go on the something is super into bracket natural, but without any uh, industrial things surrounding this product, and the more you you will get some emotion, you will get something really coming from a specific origins. And I think this is what we call the art de vivre à la française. It's like um, we're talking about material, material. I mean, the, the, the raw product, that's what uh, really is important. It takes so much passion to do any of this, uh, particularly the length of time it takes. And you talked about you, Quintus, you just planted in 2011, you just bought it, so it takes... You know, how many leaves does it take? Four or five leaves before you produce a vintage. Then you have a tasting and you sort of compare yourself against the greats of that region to see where you need to go. And it's just this ongoing process to be better at expressing that art de vivre. Yes. When it comes down to it. I mean, that's that's the passion part of this business. It's like, uh, again, uh, making wine and a terroir is exactly like, uh, like uh, a child or... Or dog, or you, you you have some um, on every single individual. It's a great analogy. You have some uh, some capacities 
some qualities. Yeah. And it's your own responsibilities to look after it and to help them to grow. I love as that. As simple as this. It's well, almost like that. linear with a human being, right? You're three, four years old. There's not, there's not much going on in there. You're 15. Things are starting to kind of make sense. And then now you're 20. And wow, you're starting to... Yep. Well, that is really fascinating. It's the same, and, have, and again, you, you sometimes you know you have some default, but some default which can bring an extra uh, sense of personality. Also, you know, if you take everything that is perfect, perfect, sometimes the perfection <laughs> can lead to something boring. Yeah, that's right. You know, and uh, a blend in Bordeaux, we talk uh, a lot at Aubryon. Sometimes we have we work by parcels and we unify every parcel separately, but sometimes a parcel which is not like a wow can bring in the total blend an extra personality that yeah. you will say, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you taste many wines of that ilk or that f character that's like, yeah. you can see that they spent a lot of money and did a lot of work and tried to you know, make the biggest wine they could make, but we forgot about the structure and what it takes to make somebody say, wow, this is really, really we, reflective. We, we should not forget something. There is no perfect recipe to make wine. Of course, it's not. impossible, right. and that's the beauty of wine. That's why it's we cannot explain from A to Z. Sometimes I have questions. I say, we don't know. We can't explain it. It's because that's the, the beauty terroir, of it. the climate, the vintage, the people, something happens. You don't know, and it creates. That's magic. the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Like even the wines in that picture, my dad. I, I remember the picture. There's some wines there. I'd love to be able to taste today. It's you. That's me, yeah, 1975. Oh, I feel good. good. <laughs> you look good back then, right? <laughs> okay, and we're already almost at an hour, so I don't want to take any more of your time, but I have this book I showed it to you earlier. It's called Wine is the Best Medicine. It's by Dr. Murray, who is a French medical doctor, as well as a homeopathic doctor. And he's got a whole book full of human maladies, human ailments, and and the the wine cure. Yeah. At least symptom relief, anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give you. Uh, um, now you don't have to worry about getting it right or wrong. I'm more interested in, like, you know, why would you choose the answer that you chose? Yeah. Much like the master of wine test. Okay. So let's go with. Um, let's try this. Uh, well, this would be a tough one for you. Menopause. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> Who knows? So you could have um, a dry champagne, a young Beaujolais. Or Saint Emilion. Which uh, one of those? I will start with the champagne, then the Beaujolais, and then the Saint Emilion, because anyway, the menopause, <laughs> you need to drink to forget about this. <laughs> so I take the three. <laughs> you say, well, one of those is right, so I guess I guess you did a good job. Well, it says here that you should have the Saint Emilion. I, I, yeah. I set you up for that. Well, how much should you drink? What's the dosage of that? Uh, until you fall asleep. Until you fall asleep. Two glasses a meal. So that's a bottle, right? A bottle a, a day. And the, here's the reason that doctor says, because they're rich in o, o, enotannins, which act through the medium of the packed... Wait a minute. I, I don't know what is wrong with me today. I can't read. I can't speak. The enotannins, which act through the medium of factor P, whatever that is, on the resistance of the capillaries. So you figure that one out, but uh, you got you got a third of it right. You said the Santa Million, and that's two glasses a meal, and we're going to leave it at that, and we'll have to call it Santa Million and Quintus, <laughs> yes. right? Four glasses of Quintus. Very good. Is that good? I appreciate the time today. But uh, you, just to come back to, to this part yes. uh, very briefly, what is important, don't, don't forget that we say that uh, drink responsibly. Drink responsibly. But the most important, it doesn't matter... Uh, if it's one, two glasses, it depends on every single individual. So most important is to have a, a life that is well balanced. As long as you are well in your mind, as long as you go with the proper and the good food and drinks, everything will be will be good. But it, it, that's everything awesome. has to be balanced. So it doesn't matter if you drink one bottle a day, but you have a good balanced life, you have a a good, uh, you, you do your own sport, uh, you eat well, you mm -hmm. eat vegetables, seafood, uh, meat, whatever. You can be even vegan, I don't care. But it's just a matter of being balanced. Because if you are balanced in the way you drink, the way you eat, you are balanced in your mind and everything comes from your mind at the well beginning. So that's maybe the most that, important. Maybe that's me. the definition of art de vivre à la française, no? 
I think so, yeah. So says. Yeah, enjoying life every single moment, well, especially that, with the people. Since yeah. you brought that up, this is the book from 19... By the way, the, these books are the, the most important things that happened in the wine business, the contemporary wine business, in the last 50 years. We know that Sorry, the Judgment of Paris, yeah. we won't talk about that right now. And then we're going to talk about uh, 1990, the French paradox, which which says here that the French live longer than Americans, and it's because of what you just said, that balance of life between uh, uh, being healthier in the sense of your mind being clear, you're drinking your wine, you're having olive oil, you're not stressed out, You, the life is simpler in your mind, it's simpler. It's, it's a capacity to let it go. You know, we say French people... We are arrogant. We don't give a blah, blah, blah about <laughs> anything. That's true, but it helps us to be more stable, mentally speaking. And so whatever, we want some cheese and wine. Yeah, yeah why not? Not a problem. It's okay. Maybe next day we'll get some veggies. That's it. And uh, just a salad and it be okay. And so on and so forth without overthinking too much about this. Most important for me is sharing this moment with your loved ones because life is short. You have to enjoy as long as you... I think you feel this mentally, you free yourself, you enjoy the moment, you enjoy your life, and it's uh, it's easier to have a well-balanced life. You're correct, and I appreciate that. And then, this, of course, in Sideways, uh, the the movie that came out in 2004, which, which ruined Merlot sales, but as we know at the end of the movie, he drinks a bottle of 62 Cheval Blanc <laughs> out of a plastic glass. So that's good. That's good life balance right there. A hamburger yeah. and a Cheval Blanc. No, so <laughs> as long as you enjoy the moment, that's what matters. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in today. I know it was a hard day. It was, it was raining and there was a lot going on. I and I wish you success uh, for the, you so the rest of the week and travel back. And when we get out to Bordeaux, uh, we'd love to come check out all of the estates and see what's going on. Whenever, we're, feel free to, to come. And any one of the person listening to the podcast, if you're coming to Bordeaux. Come and pay for the visit. We'll be very happy to welcome you and uh, to that. show you uh, our estates. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul, Callum, Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. And of course, all these podcasts are sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, 48 years in business. Don't forget to visit our website, wineofthemonthclub.com. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers. Cheers.